cannabinoid system, and there are cannabinoid drugs coming out on the market that have nothing to do with cannabis, but they affect the same system in the brain that cannabis does. And so THC is an agonist of the receptor. And agonists are, to use the standard analogy, the keys that fit in the lock and turn the lock. They are chemicals on the outside of the cell that are able to fit into the receptor and make chemical changes inside the cell. And CBD is an antagonist of the same receptor. And it is a key that fits in the lock but doesn't turn the key. But having TH, or CBD in the key, in the keyhole, keeps THC from fitting in the key. So the two of them together tend to work toward analgesia because the antagonists block the psychoactive reaction of THC. Okay, now which of these senses is most affected by THC? Anybody? Uh, aside from the ingestion, you know, you know, of it. THC is clear, it has no smell, you can't hear it, you can't taste it, but you can feel it. So I guess touch is it. Now, much of what I'm going to say is based on this paper. It came out four years ago, based on work that was done in Amsterdam and in Italy. And I recommend anybody who has a clue of what I'm talking about at the end of this lecture to go read this thing, because this explains what we're talking about better than anything else. And this answer once and for all the fact that THC and CBD are products of the same gene, two different variations of the gene in the same location. Now remember, you have two copies of the gene in your body, one from your mom, one from your dad. Cannabis is the same way. And I'm using the old Mendelian bean diagram to explain uh, first and second and third generations. If, and you can use tall and short, or you can use THC genes and CBD genes interchangeably here. But if you got two plants, one that's just got THC genes, and one plant that just has CBD genes, and you cross them, every single time you're going to get a plant that inherits one THC gene and one CBD gene. Now, cross those again, that's what this bottom right hand corner is, under normal genetics, you're going to get three of the dominant gene and one of the uh, recessive gene, right, in the, in, the, in the second generation. The THC and CBD works differently because these are co-dominant. One is not expressed over the other. So one isn't recessive and one isn't dominant. They both are expressed. So if you have a plant that gets two THC, two A2, THC genes, it's just going to express THC. If you get a plant that has a THC and a CBD gene, it's going to express both chemicals. If you get a plant that has just, oh, I see a mistake in my slide, sorry, the bottom one should say CBD times CBD, you only get CBD. Now, this is the scattered diagram. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Between the real swag and the regular swag. Oh, let me go back to that. T when you're getting THC and CBD together, we don't get that very much in America because those varieties that we're growing are pretty much just THC bearing varieties. All of your, you know, 500 varieties available in these clubs in California pretty much have the same cannabinoid profile. And um, if you took that and crossed it with industrial hemp, You'd get a plant that most people wouldn't want to smoke as a recreational drug, but it would work pretty good as a medicine for certain causes like MS and spasticity disorders. Like, for instance, Moroccan hash has a lot of CBD in it, and this is why in England they say that cannabis works so good for MS, but you don't have the MS patients here using it so much because all they're getting here is THC. I hope that's clear. Um, <laughs> Exatavex, the, the drug on the market, uh, I, um, I'm not supposed to talk about, uh, is um, uh, uh, a combination of THC and CBD, and it works well for spasticity and for pain, but it isn't so good at getting you high because of the combination of those two chemicals together. Now this is the fourth, the second generation of crosses of pure plants, and you see that 
One quarter of the plants have just THC. One half of the plants express both CBD and THC. And one part of the, you know, one quarter of the plant produces just CBD. Except notice that the curve at the bottom, the CBD curve, comes off the axis a little bit. And that's because CBD out in the sun and heat slowly, might, you know, minimally turns to THC. So this is why there, this little bit between the, the bottom axis and that CBD line is what the feds are regulating the industrial hipsters about. This 0.3% comes not from genetics, but because any CBD out in the sun is going to turn a little bit into THC. And this is what the harassing is over. You know, marijuana is the stuff on the, the left with 8, 10, 12, 22% THC. And it's this, these industrial hemp varieties on the bottom are, are worthless for marijuana, of course. But this chart tends to show you how far apart they really are. Now, um, I'm going to say one thing. Um, the goal of breeding industrial hemp is to bring down the level of CBD and THC at the same time because we have to, to meet regulations, reduce the amount of THC in our end product. And if we have THC genetics in the industrial hemp we grow in Canada, we get THC on the seeds and it gets into the food and people fail urine tests and we get sued and it becomes a big mess. So the industry has enacted test blood standards that keep the level of THC you know, well down below what the government expected of us. And we do this voluntarily and based on science that showed us what kind of urine, well, how, how low we had to keep our THC levels in our food so that someone could eat seven portions of hemp a day and still pass a urine test. This is ridiculous. We're not talking about anything but these urine tests. It has nothing to do with health levels or anything else, but we're able to do it only because we're using normal breeding techniques to get THC bearing genes out of the plant. Now, this is one gene out of thousands and the long, several million long code of the genetics of this plant, all the different characteristics that are embroiled in the genetic package that each one of these plants has, the CBD THC decision it's just one tiny little bit of it. It doesn't seem to affect how a plant grows. It doesn't seem to affect fiber quality or seed yield or anything. It simply has to do with how this one particular enzyme is uh, transcribed into this one or two different uh, uh, compounds. I also wanted to take a minute to say that science in recent years has come up with whole new ways of thinking about what sativa and indica mean. And this is the work of Carl Hillig. Anybody who's interested needs to study it because he has, uh, after 15 years of work at the University of Indiana, finally begun to publish his work and his findings. And it is changing the whole species debate about cannabis, the whole origin debate about cannabis. But this summarizes Carl's work where the indica and the sativa species split early in the origin of the plant and went in two different directions. Uh, nowadays, we're very busy combining them back. Uh, this is a new study you might have read about a couple of weeks ago where they're doing gene mapping on plants, trying to figure out the difference between hemp and marijuana. And this is true in terms of you can look at plant populations and see that the genetics are way different from each other. But if they wanted, we could breed a low THC plant that fit right in where the skunk is now, believe it or not. That you could have plants that smell just like Acapulco gold and have no THC. You can't smell THC. So again, one gene determines the difference between THC and CBD. There's thousands of genes in the plant, and we can easily breed for THC CBD content in the varieties that we're breeding. And Canada has been doing this with quite a bit of success. The farmers up there are doubling and tripling their hemp acreage every year, and, and the rest of the world is able to do this so we can do this here. Now, I have one second part of the show. I want